Hi. Our show today covers the gamut, from a secret U.S. government nuclear shelter to the astonishing revelations of a fascinating lady who is a digital guru to Bill Gates. And don't forget the most uplifting segment, a cancer survivor who beat the odds with a new experimental treatment. It's pretty amazing. So jump aboard and we'll take you on a wild ride. We're going to take you on a deep trip underground. It's a concrete symbol of the Cold War here in the U.S., close to Washington, D.C., and it reminds us of the fear we lived under from the threat of nuclear war. For about 40 years, this was one of the best kept secrets of the Cold War, the nuclear shelter of the American government. On the surface, it looks like a five-star hotel, the Greenbrier in West Virginia. But underground, without the public's knowledge, the Defense Department built a four-story shelter to protect more than 500 senators and representatives in case of a nuclear war. The construction started in 1958 and was completed three years later, but it was only at the end of the Cold War in 1996 that the U.S. government decided to open the doors to the public. Linda Walls is the Assistant Director of Public Relations for the Greenbrier. The history of this shelter is absolutely fascinating. This was constructed between the years of 1958 and 1961 during the height of the Cold War. President Eisenhower felt there should be a safe emergency relocation facility for the members of Congress so that the legislative form of government could have continued in the event of an emergency. The location of the shelter is strategic. Within a four and a half hour drive from Washington, it is sufficiently close to be reached by car and it's far enough away to escape the radioactive contamination that could result from a possible nuclear attack on the American capital. This was a hospital during World War II and over 20,000 GIs were treated here. Then General Eisenhower came here to be treated. Uh, there are those who say he came here to play a lot of golf, but uh, yes and no, but General Eisenhower was here, liked this area very much, and when a site was being chosen for the location of the emergency relocation facility. This was tops on the list. Other factors contributed to the selection of this location. The first problem was how to dig such a huge hole without attracting attention. With that in mind, the hotel grounds were ideal. 6,500 acres that could hide all the soil from the excavation without any suspicion. Another factor was the ability to disguise the bunker underneath an established hotel in a small town. White Sulphur Springs. This is a hotel that employs nearly 1,600 persons, so it was not unusual then to have more employees here. It's also not unusual to have trucks making pickups and deliveries. We were also within a, a good distance from Washington to be safe, hopefully, in the event that Washington would be attacked. By building the bunker in a small town also added to the secrecy of the project. Perhaps you're from a small area yourself. Uh, you might know that small town people tend to be maybe a little more clannish. We might talk to each other, but not necessarily to the outsiders. And this helped keep the secret. But to protect the secret of the construction, the U.S. government took drastic measures. Everyone who had clearance to work in here had been investigated by the FBI. They had signed letters that they would never, ever divulge the secrets. And they did not. Harlan Wickline, a stock handler in the shelter since 1961, has some vivid recollections. I signed a paper in his ticket telling if I ex talked about this place, I would get 20 years in prison if I discovered the secret location of it. 
We asked him if he was worried or nervous about keeping this secret. No, not really, because I worked through the green bar and I was maintenance, and then I asked me what I worked at, I just told them maintenance of the green bar, and so that's pretty well took care of everything. For more than 30 years, Harlan and several hundred employees were paid to maintain the shelter so that it was always ready in case of a nuclear war. Once in a while, they refreshed the linens of the 1,800 beds reserved for the members of Congress. They swept the floors and changed the newspapers and magazines that hadn't been read in all those years. As you can see, the accommodations are Spartan-like. This is not five-star, five-diamond like the rest of the Greenbrier. The shelter is over 100,000 square feet in size and can accommodate over 1,000 people. There are 18 dormitories with 60 beds each. The senators and representatives would be segregated according to their age in case of an emergency. Republicans and Democrats would be forced to share beds and shelves and bathtubs. Men and women were supposed to sleep in different rooms. Beside the 543 members of Congress, the beds would be occupied by secretaries, assistants, doctors, and cooks. Family members would only be permitted to stay in the second shelter at the bottom of the hotel, a lot more luxurious, but not nuclear proof. You'll notice that there are no piano bars in here. There are no cocktail lounges here. Uh, forms of recreation would have included televisions. In more recent years, there were not televisions here in the late 50s and early 60s, but there were televisions in more recent years. There were magazines and books that were continually updated. Communication with the outside world was achieved by means of an 80-foot aerial antenna. Inside, the telephone central system and a room for radio and television completed the service. Government activities took place in a small room for the House, another one for the Senate, and a general conference room. There were areas that would have been used for communications, and it is hoped the entire United States would not have been destroyed. So there still would have been communications with small towns in the United States. We would also like to think that, that every large city would not be destroyed. Whatever, there would still have been contact, there still would have been communications with those other areas. The senators and representatives could have stayed for two months without worrying about food or energy. A factory with three diesel-driven generators guaranteed the electrical power needed for heating, air conditioning, and air purification. Incinerators, electrical maintenance controls, ventilation systems, as well as an infirmary and a pharmacy. Nothing was missing in this monument to the Cold War. But the most impressive feature were the massive doors built to resist nuclear attack. This is one of three doors that conceal this facility. This door is a 25-ton blast door, perfectly balanced of concrete and steel, and it cannot be opened from the outside. Today, these doors are open as a tourist attraction. Since the U.S. government authorized public visits, the shelter finally acquired something that it's lacked for 40 years, a practical purpose. It's my hope, my very sincere hope, um, as an American, that our constitutional rights will be maintained in the future because there is another facility like this somewhere. Time Magazine and other cognoscenti regard her as the mistress of web domains, the guru of the digital age. For Bill Gates, she's more than that. Whether she praises or criticizes him, she's one of the people he listens to with rapt attention. Scope is privileged to introduce you to Esther Dyson. She is 48 years old, has no children, and is a workaholic. 18 hours is her normal day. She doesn't know how to drive, doesn't even have a telephone at home. She's Esther Dyson, chairwoman of ED Ventures Holdings and editor of a newsletter specializing in the internet. Her number one client is Bill Gates, owner of Microsoft and possessor of an $85 billion fortune. Esther laid down the strategies that brought Microsoft to the dominant position in software in the world. She's also written a comprehensive book on the present status and the future of the computer world. Let's hear what she has to say. I started out as a journalist and then went to work on Wall Street for five years because I wanted to not simply tell stories, but I wanted to actually make judgments and, and be responsible for the outcomes. 
which I thought I'd do by picking stocks, but it turned out that really is also just telling stories. But in the end, telling stories is what I do, and it is the power to make other people see things and to interpret them. I like doing things that have not been done before. I like finding people that haven't been found. I like explaining things that other people don't understand. I don't want to be redundant. And so I gravitate to things that are not clear. I don't have a lot of power. I don't command huge armies of people. I don't have huge amounts of capital. My power is making people see things. And to some extent, I mean, if you're in a meeting trying to raise your hand, people won't listen to a woman. But one-on-one, -on -one, people are, are less threatened by a woman pointing something out. But doing what I do, I'm not in this game. I'm not trying to be Bill Gates. I'm not threatening someone else's company. I'm just you know, trying to point things out, explaining how it works, uh, putting one person in touch with another person. I'm trying to sell it through my actions. And you know, the product by itself is worth something, and I hope it's worth a lot to read. And frankly, I didn't write the book just to be read. I wrote the book so that somebody would want to put me on television so that I could reach more people than even the people who are likely to read the book. Bill Gates does not consult with me. He, he listens to me. Um, I listen to him. To some extent, you could say the government does consult with me. Not in any way in a paid basis, but I'm one of the people that they listen to, and I, I talk to various people there. The fact that you could buy a Windows machine from lots of different suppliers, so they were very price competitive. And they just got a bigger share of the market, and they leveraged that. And Apple. Yeah, I, I agree, the Macintosh was nicer to use, but it, you could buy it from only one source. They didn't support the software developers as well, they competed with them, and so Windows won. You know, being bright isn't the issue, it's personality. I mean, you asked me what was so effective about Bill Gates, and it was his personality, not his intelligence. I mean, of course you need to have a certain level of smarts, but then you need the character. Steve is not as officially bright as Bill. I would say he's more imaginative. And Bill is, is certainly not as bright as a lot of the programmers I know, but he's got the right character and he, he takes his intelligence and applies it in the right direction. His actions haven't changed. The context has changed to the extent that the Justice Department sees a huge threat and is taking action. Email is a very quick and efficient form of communication between people who know one another already. Because I get the message directly from Fred, I read what he wants, I answer him directly. There's no intermediaries, there's no interpretation, and there's none of the overhead of the half hour meeting. The half hour meeting is very important to establish the contact, to, to make the friendship if you like. The point is, email is an additional very efficient channel. If all you do is send email and you never meet anybody, that doesn't work. If you spend all your time just meeting people, you're going to be very inefficient at keeping up communications. Well, again, cyberspace is the big mystery of, of this age. It's getting broader. It's getting less concentrated in the United States. It's getting more robust, both simply in terms of not breaking down and in terms of better security systems being put in. I don't like to use that word democracy because I think it gets misused so much. What word would you like to use? Decentralization and, and power to individuals. I mean, See, democracy to me is still the tyranny of the majority, and what I'm talking about is more and more decision-making back into the hands of individuals. 
there's this knee-jerk assumption democracy is good. Democracies elect really bad people on occasion. I'm talking about the power of the individual. And that happens now. To a great extent, I think that's good. To some extent, I think it's bad because, you know, if you get collections of bad individuals, they can do bad stuff. But net net, I would rather see a system that constantly erodes the power of the establishment, which the net does. Oh, it's done very little so far. It's given a lot of people access to one another. It's, it's changed the lives of a few million people, but it hasn't really changed the world at large yet. It's going to. What you're about to see is an excellent example of triumph of the spirit. This is the story of a courageous patient with an incurable throat cancer who refused to give up, persevered, and beat the odds. Disillusioned by doctors, this brave individual resorted to his last chance to survive a malignant cancer, an experimental treatment using an unknown and dangerous substance, retinoid acid. I did jump out of a plane at 14,000 feet. Uh, I forgot to pull my ripcord. Fortunately, the people that jumped with me, uh, one of them pulled it for me. I was having so much fun. Steve Otto, 48 years young, is enjoying life just as much, if not more, than before his ordeal. In August of 1993, doctors discovered that he had a cancer in the throat. One month after being operated on for the removal of a tumor, the cancer reappeared in the same location, worse than before. At one point in my life, uh, just a few years ago, I lost 70 pounds. I lost all my hair. I was dying. For eight months, Steve tried conventional treatments, radiation and chemotherapy without any improvement. This is when the surgeon indicated to me that they might have to operate removing my lower jawbone, which was no problem because they can replace that with a prosthesis, but uh, they would also have to remove most of my lower throat and tongue, which would mean I would never be able to eat. Uh, again, I would have to be fed through a tube in my stomach, and uh, speech would be virtually impossible. As Steve refused to undergo the surgery, his sister convinced him to seek a second opinion. And that is how he got to the Lombardi Cancer Center at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Nair Rizvi, working in the experimental treatment program of the center, was one of the first doctors to try to help Steve. He had an incurable cancer. Um, had not responded to standard treatments and uh, one of the experimental treatments that we were doing was with a new type of uh, uh, retinoid uh, which is an oral um, drug which is similar to vitamin A but this is a synthetic uh, more potent more selective drug. Contrary to chemotherapy which poisons the cells indiscriminately Retinoid acid attacks the cells in such a manner that they program their own extinction. Steve Otto was one of the first patients to try this new drug therapy, and his positive results impressed the doctors. After beginning treatment, he had uh, improvement in his swallowing, um, resolution uh, of his pain symptoms, um, you know, he was able to eat again, put weight back on, and um, return to his job. And how is he feeling now? He's doing great. Um, he, um, on, on, on the, or the first point is we were very pleased and uh, to see that he responded to the treatment three years ago. And the second point is that we're astounded and uh, very happy that he's continued um, to be in remission uh, by CAT scan, by examination, um, and is really back to his normal life. And is there a chance the cancer may return? The cancer certainly can. It's, it's once again, it's uh, hard to predict the future. And uh, all we can say is it's been over three years and the cancer has not come back. So that's a good sign. Take a pill a day. You get a headache, you take an aspirin. I take one of my pills a day. It's that simple. I get up every morning, just eat one pill every morning. For the time being, retinoid acid is being tested on patients with throat and lung cancers. According to Dr. Rizvi, there is no intention to commercialize the drug. Steve was a success story that helped the doctors in their understanding of the drug. 
Other patients did not enjoy the same positive results. Their tumor stopped growing, but didn't disappear. As for Steve, he's up and about. He is back working as a barman in the same restaurant where he worked for eight years. Presently, he dedicates himself to experiencing new sensations, skydiving, parachuting, and scuba diving. He's also getting ready to try something new and different. Possibly a trip to Russia, possibly, and try what they call wings over Moscow. I'd like to see about maybe a, you rent a MiG-29 for one hour and they take you up in a supersonic jet. Sounds absolutely incredible. After all the struggles he's been through, Steve tries to summarize his philosophy of life. When you have death coming at you, looking you so close in the eye, and you realize how life, how short life can be, all of a sudden you just have to go for it. You have to do those things uh, to add that excitement to give you your life what, it, what it's all about. In reality, Steve has come to see life in a different light and he has a message for those who have to undergo similar ordeals. There are many days of frustration. You're so tired, you're so fatigued, you're so nauseous. You have to work at it. The Lord gives you a certain amount of things, or whoever you believe in, gives you a certain amount. Then you yourself, you have to work for it. If you want it, you can live. I was dying, I'm here. I'm jumping out of planes. I'm canoeing on rivers. I'm riding horses. I'm living a new life. Everyone can do that. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. We look forward to seeing you again in our next installment, where we have more exciting surprises in store for you. So until then, we wish you all the best. Take care.